Bon Apremidi, I think is more applicable, to Sting. Let's hear it for him. <laughs> Welcome, Sting. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Now, I'm in a bit of a confusion here. I'll have to get you to clear it up straight away. I've been told by quite a few people in the production team that, yes, you are going solo, and this is the first time you've spoken to anyone since you've gone solo, but your record company says, no, police still exist. He's going solo as well as maintaining his record career with police. Help. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That is it, is it? <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's a very old-fashioned idea that one band should stay together forever. It's equally old-fashioned to assume that as soon as bands don't recall that they've broken up. We've actually, we're having what's called a hiatus where we're deciding what to do next. Uh -huh. We're still friends. We still uh, plan to see each other and work together in the future. But we're just going to see what happens over this next year. Okay, so what's, what's happening in Paris at the moment with you? Well, I'm uh, warming up for, the, for this world tour which I'm about to embark on. Um, I've got a, a bunch of... Uh, all black jazz musicians, not New Zealanders, but black musicians. <laughs> and uh, we're playing music that is uh, hopefully uh, non-categorical. -cate In other words, it's, it's not jazz and it's not rock, it's something else. I'm very excited about it. Okay. I, I mentioned in the introduction about your years as a school teacher, and it's an interesting thing because uh, now music is your life and uh, indeed acting, uh, being part of a band and being a solo performer. What, what does that bring to you as a man and also as a performer, the fact that you did teach for all those years? Uh, I, uh, I, you I must have something that's been a plus out of the whole thing. I think uh, to stand up in front of a class of very cynical school children and uh, impart information and not be uh, thrown out is, is a good uh, apprenticeship or a grounding for a performer. You know? mm -hmm. Basically, you have to stand up there and um, be credible. And uh, teaching allowed me to... Uh, Practice that. <laughs> it certainly is a, a tough one to a one to about thirty confrontation, isn't it? Teaching. I've, I've got to ask about the first solo LP because the title is a good one, the the Dream of the Blue Turtles. And uh, I just wonder if this. I, I can't think of a book this might have been inspired by, but I know several of your other songs have been inspired by book titles. No, it wasn't inspired by a book title. Where'd it it was uh, in, inspired by um, my interest in Jungian psychology, where you're taught to. Uh, make use of your dreams in a creative sense. You either, either paint them or draw them or you write music from them. And I wrote a piece of music called The Dream of the Blue Turtles, which uh, graphically describes this dream I had. It's fairly wacky. I haven't got three <laughs> hours to explain it. <laughs> okay. We'll just take it for granted there was a dream that had blue turtles starring in it, right? When I, when I come to Australia, I'll explain it. <laughs> <laughs> blue turtles in depth. What about the other tracks? Have they got uh, political themes or... Uh, uh... Um, a lot of people have been uh, had their arms up in the air saying it's, it's too political, this record. Have they? Uh, I think I'm probably more outspoken on this record than I've ever been before. There are songs about uh, the proliferation of nuclear power, the, uh, the minor strike in England, heroin addiction. Uh, most of the songs have an issue um, at the core of them. Do you get much reaction to a message song like that? Uh, have you had in the past, or do you find that people still listen to the words and enjoy the beat, and all you can hope for is perhaps subconsciously something got through to them? I think that um, you can enjoy a, a pop song on, on many different levels. If, if, uh, ch if three-year-old children want to bounce around to it, they can. If you want to get deeper, I always feel that uh, there's something there if you want to get into the lyrics. But it's not essential. I mean, pop songs don't have to be meaningful. No. But uh, at the age I'm at, um, I feel it's my responsibility to um, put some kind of valency into, into the, uh, the medium. Right. <laughs> well, congratulations. Sounds very promising indeed. Very promising indeed. Uh, what sort of venues do you play in Paris? Out here, of course, it's always 12,000 or so at uh, one of your concerts. Uh, and the same in America. I mean, you get up to about 100,000 in a stadium. What's Paris? Well, I've decided to go back. Um, I think it's, it's very easy to lose touch with what it's like to entertain a small crowd that's close to you. So I'm playing at a very old, beautiful theatre called the Mogador in the Paris theatre district. Mm -hmm. And it's got velvet seats and a proscenium arch. And it's... It's a different kind of entertaining. It's a different kind of performance. Um, it's harder work because they can see you. You can't just get away with a grand gesture. You really have to work hard. 
And for me, that's a great challenge. I didn't want to lose touch with that uh, skill, if you like. Yes, it's a bit like an actor leaving movies and going back to do repertory theatre, isn't it? To face reality it's once again. It's almost, almost as radical as that. Yeah, yeah. I've enjoyed it immensely. Uh, I want the to French get... seem to love it. Good. Well, congratulations. I, I, uh, I want to get on to the acting thing because uh, Dune, the movie, is uh, still playing around the country here. And uh, you had a nice evil baddie part to play in that. Well, I, it's, it's my job as an actor to find uh, a reason why a person is evil. And I have to say I'm very sympathetic with that character. I think he's uh, misunderstood. He's from a bad home background. <laughs> he's kind to Anna. He's kind to animals. <laughs> He's kind to animals, right. Well, what about Frankenstein? Because you're playing him later in the year. It hasn't been released out here yet, but a movie called The Bride. And you play Frankenstein, and you've got uh, Jennifer Beale oh, from Flashdance as, um, <laughs> as Eva the Bride. Now, um, what was that like? A, a glamorous experience? Um, filmmaking is rarely glamorous. It, it's, more, it's, it's like working in a factory outdoors most of the time, <laughs> where it's raining on the machinery. Oh, really? Um, what's nice about it is that you work with such wonderful people, the directors and actresses and actors and technicians. It's really, it's a good experience, but it's, it's not what you think it is, you know, drinking Bacardi on beaches and things. Yes, uh, sitting, back in, <laughs> sitting back in a director's chair and waiting for someone to come and give you the next shot. We just uh, had a, a freeze frame here on the screen of you riding a horse. Was that uh, all straightforward, that particular scene? I love riding horses. One of the great things about making films is you learn to do new things. And uh, doing stunts on a horse is something I really love doing. I was paid for it. I'm interested in another film which I, I think you've just completed. That was one that was directed by the Australian Fred Skepsi, and you got to star with who's got to be the greatest screen actress currently, Meryl Streep. This is something that amazes me. I'm paid to do things that other people only dream of. So I did a love scene with Meryl Streep. Oh. Which was so oh. Yes, please. Do you want an understudy? I mean, <laughs> you, no, I, I mean, is there any reshooting coming up that you can't make? Because we are very Forget similar it. looking. <laughs> Stop laughing. <laughs> you, you really, you really got paid to make love to Meryl Streep. I couldn't believe it. I was just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> We want more. You want more? Yeah. No, I can't. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me. Okay. Well, let me ask you this then. Were, were you daunted as an actor? Because it, it, it's not something that you have a, uh, a great deal of depth in, in terms of the years of experience and uh, the legitimate sort of training that uh, a Meryl Streep has, who was a, a Broadway actress before she went to film. Yeah. Were you daunted at the prospect of working with someone like her? Um, yes and no. I, I think the best actors I've worked with have been the most helpful. And I don't go onto a film set and say, well, here I am, God's gift to acting. I'm, I say, I'm an apprentice, I'm learning how to do it, help me out. And I've worked with Lady Olivier, I've worked with people like Denham Elliott, mm -hmm. Meryl Streep, and they've all been wonderful to me. And I think it's, it's like learning to play uh, tennis by playing McEnroe or, or Lendl. If you work with the best people, you learn quicker. You do, but you also die quicker if you're not good enough. So it's a great compliment to you that you've been able to work with them. Tell me, what's she... dead yet. You ain't dead yet. <laughs> what's she really like? Is she a good sort? She's wonderful. She's great fun. We had a great time with Fred. He was a fellow Australian. Mm -hmm. Actually, one of the best directors I've ever worked with. Really classy. Knows what he's doing. Knows what he's on about. Now, the, the, the other thing which, of course, uh, has not been a hindrance to your career is the fact that you are a very good-looking man. And uh, uh, if I may quote Andy Summers, he said, if we had a short, ugly singer for a lead man, I don't think we'd be where we are today. Now, if I could ask you this, uh, yes. indeed it's an embarrassing question, but how do you see yourself? Um, I don't think I'm particularly uh, unpleasant-looking, but I'd rather concentrate on the fact that I can sing and write songs and the fact that uh, my... Uh, my cheekbones and my nose are in the right place, you know. Yes. It doesn't concern me that much. Well, that, that must be a comforting thought because there are some people who just wake up every morning thinking that uh, there goes another day and I'm not quite what I was yesterday. Well, me too, you know. I'm getting older. <laughs> but I'm Half your luck. And this is not enjoy being old. <laughs> yes, it's wonderful. Can I... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you about another production, your, your new son, Jake? We must congratulate him. He has a new son, Jake. That was, uh, that that was easy. <laughs> uh, that, that, was, that was a co-production, of course, we must point out. Not all your own work. When, when did Jake arrive? 
Jake arrived just after the concert the other night. I, I went straight from the stage to the hospital to witness it. And it's my fourth child, yeah. and it's the first time I've actually been there. And I was totally overcome. I com com completely went to pieces. It was the most wonderful emotional experience. Well how worth it. How do you view fatherhood? Um, well, I always do it by accident. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us are. <laughs> well, I, I've never, I've never planned a child. It's just, uh, it just keeps happening to me. You know, I don't regret any of them. They're wonderful. Have you found out what causes it? <laughs> I'm working on it. I, oh, I think good. I'm close. Good. I think I'm close to finding out what it is. <laughs> but I, I, is it, is it something that becomes a very important part of your life? And you say, well, I can't let things get too busy where I don't enjoy these children growing up. What it's done for me is. Uh, it's, just, it's debunked the rock star myth of just living for today. I think having children uh, gives you a stake in the future. And uh, it's up to all of us to make sure that the world in 10 years' time is, is a w one where uh, our children can live happy and fulfilled lives. And the chances are getting slimmer and slimmer every day. So I feel, uh, as a father, it's important to try and change the world for the better. Yes, it does, it does bring things into a very sharp focus, there's no doubt about that. So, you've done three tours of Australia, are we going to see you again in the foreseeable? Absolutely. I, I think Australia is one of my favourite places. I know Australia is one of my favourite places. The food's great, the weather's great, the women are beautiful. I love it. I'm coming back in February. I can't wait. Right. Well, we shall look forward to seeing you. Congratulations on the new sun. Thank you very much for joining us from Paris tonight and uh, being such a great guest. Ladies and gentlemen, Sting. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.